I want to live an intentional life, although it's hard to know how to do that sometimes without getting swept up in our fast-moving world. The best way to figure out the kind of life that you want to live, I have found, is by trying things out. So, I decided to perform a little experiment. In episode 6 of my series, Stepping into the Lives of the People that I Admire, I decided to try living like the Dalai Lama, a man who embodies childlike joy despite all of the challenges that he has faced. Love and compassion are necessities, not luxuries. Without them, humanity cannot survive. Those are words from the man that is the spiritual leader of the Tibetan people and a refugee that lives in India. The name Dalai Lama comes from the Mongolic word Dale, which means ocean or big, and the Tibetan word Lama, meaning master or guru. He champions compassion and works tirelessly towards a more peaceful world. This is my experience living like the Dalai Lama. We just made it out here, up in the mountains in Austria. It's super beautiful. There's a gorgeous town down below. The sun's setting. Already I can feel the energy coming down. That's totally, I think, the point of this. It's about learning about the art of slow living, I suppose. I think I'm only gonna realize how hard it is actually tomorrow morning when I'm waking up at three. To start to get into that rhythm, we're gonna quickly just sort of try to end the day. It's so beautiful, wow. And hopefully we'll be rested enough for things come tomorrow morning. There's something magical about this. The air is so fresh and crisp. It feels outside of my comfort zone. It feels like an adventure. So um, I'm excited. I'm already shivering a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a breakdown of the Dalai Lama's daily routine. 3 a.m. Wake up, shower, prayers, meditations, prostrations. 's still sleeping it is 3 30 in the morning take it a few minutes to get up get dressed wash my face stretch a little bit and now it's time to begin meditating it's a bit difficult to speak this early in the day but I'm excited to begin meditating since we are dealing with emotions so the best method to deal with that is so, so called meditation. Not for next life, not for heaven, <laughs> but this is for day to day's well being. How do you feel? I really needed back support. It was good though. 5 a.m., short walk around residence. This is insane. This is so much snow. If raining, we'll use treadmill. We haven't really followed that advice here. It's snowing like crazy here. I gotta say my brain is barely, barely working right now. Waking up this early is difficult. I think the cold air is helping me wake up a little bit. All of this is making me realize is how much discipline is required to be able to maintain this rhythm. We all like the idea of doing this kind of thing, but actually doing it is so much more difficult. So when we got in here last night, it was already some snow for sure, but so much has come in overnight. It's like a completely different landscape. How many inches of snow is this? Look at that. Dude, I love Austria. The, the nature here is unbelievable. 5.30 a.m. Breakfast, which is often porridge and sampa. It doesn't get more Tibetan than sampa, by the way, which is a staple of the Tibetan diet and made from roasted flour. It's eaten in dozens of different ways. Pretty good. Wheat, barley kind of tastings. It's actually pretty nice. It's really healthy for you. 6 a.m. Continues morning meditations and prayers. So I was able to meditate another half an hour, so an hour and a half already today, but I'm just nodding off. So I think I'm gonna take a little nap. I don't consider that cheating, um, and I think that will actually help me be able to meditate a lot more for the rest of the day. Because right now it's just, it doesn't feel like meditation. So I think uh, this is a bit of a transition into things, so I feel okay with my decision here. At 9 a.m., he would study Buddhist texts and commentaries written by Buddhist masters. At 11.30 is lunch. This is hilarious and very random in my opinion, but um, I'm having noodle soup because apparently the Dalai Lama 
loved noodle soup. And this is my last meal of the day. There's no dinner. He wouldn't eat dinner. So I'm gonna eat as much as I possibly can of this in the hopes that I won't be starving before I go to bed. He goes to bed early, so I don't think it'll be too bad. 12.30, visits his office, conducts interviews, gets his work done. I'm not gonna lie, today has been really hard. <laughs> this was a lot more challenging than I was expecting it to be. It's just difficult to transition from very fast living, big cities, sped up, constant notifications, dopamine, etc., to slowing down. 3.30 to 5 p.m. is a gap. Some of his favorite hobbies include repairing watches and gardening. 5 p.m. is evening tea because he doesn't eat dinner and that is followed by more meditations and prayers and then at 7 p.m. his day comes to a close. So this evening I'm going to do the evening meditation that the Dalai Lama always does. Go to bed hopefully even before 7 p.m. get a good night's sleep and throw everything I've got at this tomorrow. I want to briefly explain what Tibetan Buddhist prostrations are because you might not have ever heard of them. It's basically a series of poses that you do that illustrate reverence to what is known as the Triple Gem, which is a reference to the Buddha, the Enlightened One, the Dharma, which are the teachings of the Buddha, and the Sangha, which is the monastic order that follows these teachings. Faithful Buddhists are apparently supposed to do this 100,000 times over the course of their lifetime. Before I go to bed, I'm going to do 108 of these, because 108 is a number that has enormous significance in Tibetan culture. It represents the Kangyur, which is the word of the Buddha, a loosely defined collection of sacred texts. My first day of doing this routine was a huge struggle. Without sleep, I find it hard to focus and be present. Interestingly, the Dalai Lama also believes greatly in the importance of sleep, getting eight or nine hours a night. Sleep is the most common meditation for everyone, even for birds, the most important meditation, not for nirvana, but for survival. I still had high hopes that I would get into the flow of things, but the journey inward, it would seem, would take more time. Before I go any further into this video, I want to pause briefly here to talk about the sponsor of this video, which is Storyblocks. Now, I try to shoot as much as I possibly can on my own. I think that's really important, but there are some shots that are impossible to get or wildly impractical. A couple of examples. How am I supposed to get shots of outer space? I can't. There's no way I'm flying a drone here in Paris with all the restrictions that they have here. Enter Storyblocks. They have a massive library of royalty-free, demand-driven stock footage. And it's not just that. They have templates, overlays, effects, you name it. It's really nice to have a resource like this to supplement whatever I'm creating. Uh, I think it's a very powerful tool. And I lean on Storyblocks whenever I'm looking for a creative way to create a transition or to illustrate something abstract that I'm talking about. They offer subscriptions for every budget. So if you're interested, I will leave a link to it down in the description below. Thank you, Storyblocks, for sponsoring this video. All right, let's dive back in. I feel like we're really starting to get into the flow of things. We're about to do two hours of meditation. I did some prostrations already today. I feel like waking up this early is becoming a little bit easier. Today feels like nothing like yesterday. I'm actually very excited to go inwards and see what this meditation reveals. In a world of instant feedback and gratification, it's things like meditation that help me feel grounded. There's hardly anything that is more important to me than this time for self-observation, which is a real chance to learn about myself and what I like to call my internal universe, an enormous place where everything beneath the surface is happening. If I forget to check in with that place, I often end up feeling lost and disconnected from myself. I have really enjoyed that, slowing down and exploring a little bit more my internal universe, but very difficult as well. When you're not used to sitting down and being still for that period of time, even just the physical element, it's like it, your body gets achy and you get really cold and whatnot. This was the first time that it felt like since starting this whole experiment that I was able to like be reflective on my life and in my body and it made me realize how little I do that. It feels a little bit like a reset and really an amazing way to start the day. It's cool. It's only, what time is it? Six? <laughs> Six. <laughs> Oh my God. In 1989, the Dalai Lama was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his work advocating nonviolent means to free Tibet from China. 
To me, he is a reminder of the true impact one single person can have when you commit to something. He provides an example that we can all follow in simpler ways than we may even realize. I want to offer a Tibetan Buddhist meditation technique that I find really beautiful, that I think anybody can do. Uh, it's called Tonglen. Uh, but before I do, I want to provide a little bit more context on the core principles of Tibetan Buddhism. Something that you see come up all the time, any text, any sort of interpretation, is this idea of compassion. Clearly illustrated in a very popular mantra, which goes, Om Mani Padmi Hum which translates to the jewel located in the center of the lotus. The jewel being compassion and the lotus being the heart. The practice of Tonglen can be boiled down to this idea of breathing in suffering and breathing out compassion. So you visualize somebody that you love or feel neutrally towards or even dislike. You're breathing in their suffering. They often describe this as like the visual of black smoke and you breathe out compassion. For me personally, when I'm able to get past my feelings of envy and jealousy and whatever else that is kind of boiling up, and I'm able to replace that with compassion and a feeling of love towards others, my own life becomes a lot more beautiful as well. And so you can apply this idea of Tong Len to the world. You can breathe in the suffering of the world and breathe out compassion for the world. And it's for things like this that I think Tibetan Buddhism is really special and why I think the Dalai Lama is a unique world leader. This is the kind of thing that I would love more world leaders to embody, right? Not like the corrupt politicians that are everywhere. Okay, so I'm going to read a few Buddhist texts uh, right now. I know that sounds a little bit weird and random, but this is actually something that I do from time to time. And I think there's something really valuable about sitting down and taking these words of wisdom in. In many ways, I think there are similarities across religions in this way, right? This is why a lot of people sit and read the Bible or the Torah or the Quran. It quickly became obvious to me that this is not really a daily routine to follow for a few days or weeks. It's a lifestyle. It's a mindset that can be applied to anything, no matter what your life looks like, where you live, or who you are. Does the art of living slowly, intentionally, and joyously belong only to Buddhist monks? I don't think so. I think that life awaits all of us every day, in every moment. I think the question is, and always has been, where will you choose to focus your attention? <laughs> How was the meditation? Go. It's nice, dude. It's so nice to meditate outside. I decided to try adapting the schedule in ways that could make it feel a little bit more accessible to anyone who wants to try. Maintaining the core principles, but also continuing to live a life that feels like it's mine. So I'm in Salzburg now, staying with a few friends, and I woke up around 6.15, 6.30 to go walk into the forest and do a walking meditation. Um, the sun hasn't even yet risen yet. It's very peaceful outside and I'm very excited to do this. Walking the quiet streets of Salzburg, I was struck by how a simple morning walk could make me feel so alive. Sometimes I get scared by how fast life moves, but this helped me remember that I have some control over that by bringing more intention to whatever I'm doing. It doesn't have to be a precise, rigid schedule, but I do think that my takeaways from doing the Dalai Lama's routine are that mindfulness is at the center of everything that you do. So there are regular pauses to go on walks, to meditate, to breathe, to recenter, to practice things like Tonglen. I'm just trying to listen to my body and take the day at a slower pace. There's a impulse to go quickly and to rush through things, but there's no need. Isn't it interesting how you said before, um, let's go to a quieter spot and I want to do the morning like walk 
with 10 steps forward, 10 steps backwards, so I don't get distracted by the surroundings. Do you want to bring yourself into a more secure spot to be able to meditate better? I think it helps make the meditation a bit easier. I will admit, walking up here, this is extraordinarily beautiful. I was so amazed by the beauty of Salzburg that I was a bit distracted <laughs> and not as mindful in my body. So it's helpful to go somewhere a little bit more peaceful. But no, in truth, I think it doesn't matter what you do, really. Anything can be a meditation. Um, and that is something that I think the Dalai Lama illustrates. This experiment showed me how much beauty there is all around us if we just slow down to take it in. It takes effort, but it's worth it.